We want to continue our discussion of uh, bases, of vector spaces. I want to remind you a few things. First of all, we're dealing only in this entire course with finite dimensional vector spaces, meaning that they have a basis with finitely many elements, okay? And we've seen examples of non-finite dimensional vector spaces, and they're very important, but they're beyond the scope of this course. That's the first thing. The second thing I want to remind you is what is a basis? A basis is a finite uh, set of vectors that have two properties. One, they span the entire space, they're a spanning set, and the other is that they're linearly independent. Okay, so what these two properties together mean, the way you should think of a basis, is that it's an it's a, a optimal set of vectors that generate, by means of uh, linear combinations, that generate the entire space. Optimal in the sense that there's nobody extra, okay, there, there's nobody that is itself a linear combination of the others, that's what it means to be linearly independent, a linearly independent set, so there's nobody extra, and that everybody is necessary. They span the entire, the entire set, okay? If you remove somebody, then they no longer span everything, okay? So that's a basis, and one of, the, one of the properties that we mentioned for a basis is that in finite dimensional vector spaces, any two bases that you take have the exact same number of elements. That was the motivation for defining the dimension of a vector space by the number of elements in a basis, although there could be many different bases. Okay? So that's what I want to prove now. I want to uh, prove that any two bases in a given finite dimensional vector space necessarily have the same number of elements. And the proof is going to be easy, but it's going to be based on a certain lemma which is not very trivial. And I want to prove it, because it's very special. Many, many properties that we've seen, many, many things that we've proved, are essentially straightforward, okay? They're based on the definitions, maybe some previous very basic theorems, and so on. And this lemma that I'm going to write now is, is special in the sense that there is some brightness in the, in the proof. It's not uh, just a straightforward application of the definitions, there's an idea there, okay? So, um, let's start by writing the, the lemma. It's called the uh, Steinitz exchange lemma. A lemma is, 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 is basically a theorem, except that it's uh, somehow a theorem that's just an ingredient in a bigger theorem. That's, that's what you call a lemma. But when lemmas are named after specific people, they're, they're, there's, they are those lemmas that are really important. And this is one of them. Steinitz was a, was a Jewish-German mathematician at the, at the turn of the uh, 20th century, around 1900 and a bit. And uh, we'll see the importance of of this lemma in the theorem that follows. So the lemma says as follows. Let V be um, a finite dimensional vector space. I'm again reminding you that many of the things that we'll write, and I'm not saying which are and which aren't, can be generalized to non-finite dimensional, but for us, all the vector spaces are finite dimensional. Then, the number of elements, the number of vectors in any spanning set Take any spanning set, it has a certain, a spanning set meaning that it spans the entire space, a spanning set for V. Take any one of those, count the number of vectors. It's necessarily is greater than or equal to the number of vectors in any linearly independent set. OK? 
okay? Pick two sets randomly. One spans V, any one that you want, and the other set is linearly independent. Not, no statement about it being spanning or, or, or anything else. Just a linearly independent set and separately a spanning set. The number of elements in the spanning set is going to be greater than or equal to the number of elements in the linearly independent set. That's the theorem. Okay? So before we prove this lemma, I want to write the theorem that follows from it. And then we'll go back and prove the lemma. So um, it follows from, the the from this lemma, so the theorem is um, if V is finite dimensional, then any, any two bases have the same number of elements. Which is important. That's what we use to define, that's the, what makes the definition of a dimension of a vector space well defined. Okay, so let's prove the theorem first. Prove the theorem based on the Steinitz ex exchange lemma. So let B1 be for basis and B2 be uh, two bases of V. Take two bases, okay? Both of them are bases, so if both of them have the two properties. They're simultaneously a spanning set and a linearly independent set, okay? So B1 is a spanning set, B2 is a linearly independent set, therefore the number of elements of B1 is greater than or equal to the number of elements of B2 by Steinitz's exchange lemma, right? B2 is a spanning set, B1 is a linearly independent set, therefore the number of elements of B2 is greater than or equal to the number of elements of B1. And if this is greater than or equal to this, and this is greater than or equal to this, they're equal in terms of number of elements. Clear? That's the proof. Let me write it. Since B1 is linearly independent and B2 is a spanning set for V, um, so, so do you, did you see the use of this notation for the number of elements in a set? Okay, so this stands for the number of elements in B1. Okay, let's write it. Let's not introduce notation. Uh, the number of elements, elements in uh, B2 is greater than or equal to the number of elements in B1. Do you agree? By the lemma. By the lemma. Good? Likewise, um, vice versa, So likewise, since B2 is a linearly independent set and B1 is a spanning set, the number of elements in B1 is greater or equal to the number of elements in B2. Okay, so that's the likewise vice versa. Therefore, um, how much? Good? Everybody? Okay. So now I want to prove the lemma. So you can see that really this is, this is, this is really easy once you know the lemma. So, so the, the idea is hidden in that lemma. So let's take one step back and look at the lemma. And, and it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird because it's one of those situations where I don't really have anything to hang on to. I'm taking a, 
linearly independent set and a totally different set that's spanning. They don't necessarily even have one vector in common. How do I relate their sizes? How do I approach a proof of such a thing? Okay, and that's why it's called the Steinitz exchange lemma. That's the idea. You start exchanging elements between the two and forming intermediate mixed sets about which you can say statements. Okay, and that's what I'm going to do. And it, for simplicity, I'm not going to write a full-fledged proof of this. I'm going to restrict to a simpler case where I'm going to take uh, one set with three elements and the other set with four elements. But that's going to that's going to exhibit all the ideas. Okay, so generalizing that to a general proof with m elements and n elements, it's just writing a bit more. Okay, so I want just for simplicity to restrict to a, to a specific case, just so things become more clear. But the ideas are precisely the same. Okay, so proof of the lemma. Um, or let's say proof of uh, idea, idea of the proof of the lemma. Okay, so let's take two sets. Suppose our two sets are going to be A and B. A is going to be a set with three vectors, w1, w2, and w3. And we're going to assume that A is a spanning set. Okay? A spans V. And B is going to be V1, V2, V3, V4. And B is going to be a set of linearly independent vectors. And I want to show that this cannot happen. Okay, I want to reach some contradiction. Okay, because I took only three guys in a spanning set and one more in a linearly independent set. Okay, good, clear? Okay, suppose this. Uh, we will show that this cannot happen. Okay? Okay. So consider, consider the following set. Let's call it A1. So A1 is going to be a set containing four vectors. The first one is going to be V1, which I'm taking from B. And then I'm going to take all the, all the W's. W1, W2, and W3. This is A1. Okay? You can see the exchange. You can see that, that B just contributed an element to A. Okay, that's the reason for the name. So what can I say about A1? So first of all, do you agree that A1 is a spanning set? Why? Because A itself was already a spanning set. You throw in another element, it, it just doesn't contribute anymore to the span. Or maybe, uh, well, it doesn't because we're in, in, a sing, in a certain space and it spans everything. Okay, so A1 um, is, or spans V, spans V since um, A already did. Good? Okay. Now, A1 is also linearly dependent. How do I know that A1 is linearly dependent? Because you took a linearly independent set and add another one. Well, we didn't know that this one was linearly independent. But it spans V. Right. We know that this one spans V, so we know that any element in V is a linear combination of these three guys. So V1 is a linear combination of these three guys, right? So A1 is linearly dependent. So 
So A1 spans, uh, since A, A already did, um, and A1 is linearly dependent, since V1 is a linear combination of W1, W2, and W3, because they were a spanning set. Good? Okay. And one more other remark that I want to make is that V1, V1, let's maybe mention it up here, V1 cannot be zero. It's not the zero vector. How do I know that V1 is not the zero vector? Well, V1 originated as, a, an, as an element of a linearly independent set. And in a linearly independent set, there can't be a zero vector, right? Any set that contains zero is dependent. We had that as a theorem. Good? Okay. So we know about A1 that it's a spanning set and it's linearly dependent. Good? Okay. Now, we had a theorem, we had a theorem that if you take a linearly dependent set, then any element is a linear combination, or sorry, there exists an element that's a linear combination of the others, right? But furthermore, we had a refinement of that statement that there's one element that's a linear combination of its predecessors. Remember that? That's what I want to use. And it can't be V1, it can't be V1 because V1 doesn't have any predecessors, okay? In fact, in the proof of that theorem, you can make that statement more precise, that the element that is, is a linear combination of its predecessors is not V1. You, I don't think we did that, but you can actually make that very precise. But, so one of these is a linear combination of its predecessors, okay? So, since it's linearly dependent by a previous theorem, Either W1 or W2 or W3 is a linear combination of its predecessors. And since I'm not writing a full-fledged proof, I'm going to make an assumption. Let's say it's W2. Okay, this is what's called without loss of generality. You can say it's W3, you can say it's W1, it doesn't matter, you'll see. Okay, so w one second, let, let me write this. By a previous theorem, one of the W's is a linear combination of its predecessors in, in the order they're written in A1, okay, of its predecessors, um, assume Assume that it's W2. That's what I choose. What was the question? Could you explain that part again? By previous theorem, one of the W is a linear combination of its predecessors? We had a theorem that said if you have a linearly dependent set and you, you order the elements in a certain order where the first one is non zero then one of the elements is a linear combination of those that came before it. That's a theorem that we had and proved. Okay, so I, I'm not going to prove it again. I'm, I'm basing on a theorem that we already had and proved. You can look back and, and recall that theorem. Okay, it's a linearly dependent set. That's what, it, what, what the requirement for this theorem to hold. Okay, good. So, um, okay, good. So let's define, define a set which we're going to call A2 now. We're continuing this exchanged game. And I'm going to throw W2 out. So I'm left with V1, W1, and W3. I threw away W2. And why did I throw it away? Because I know that it doesn't contribute to the uh, span of A1. Because it's uh, a linear combination of the others. So I don't need it. Okay. So a2, this set, 
is a spanning set for V because we threw out W2, but it was already a linear combination of the others, right? So this is a spanning set for V. Um, and now we're going to define a 3 to B. I'm going to add another guy from B. B was the V's, okay? So we had V1, I'm throwing in V2, and I have W1 and W3. Okay, so do you see the exchange game here? Do you see, it, it's a beautiful idea, it's just a cool idea, okay? So what do I know about A3? It spans V because A2 already spanned V and I added another guy. So A3 spans V, okay? Since A2 already spanned V and I added somebody else and it's linearly Dependent, for the same reason, right? Linearly dependent. Dependent. Why? Because A2 already spanned V, and therefore V2 was a linear combination of these guys, because any vector in V is a linear combination of these guys. Therefore, we have an element which is a linear combination of the others. Therefore, it's a linearly dependent set. Okay? So A3 spans V, and it's linearly dependent. By the theorem that we quoted, there's some guy here which is a linear combination of the others, of its predecessors. Okay? It cannot be V1 and V2, because V1 and V2 came from B, and B was linearly independent, and therefore they cannot be linear combinations one of the other. Right? So it has to be one of these Ws. Do you agree? Okay, so let's write that by the aforementioned theorem, the one about in a linearly dependent set, there's an element that's a linear combination of its predecessors. Um, which one did I assume? Um, Okay, so let's write, by the, F, by the aforementioned theorem, there is an element, there is an element, a vector, a vector belonging to A3, which is a linear combination of its predecessors. I'm out of board, so this stands for predecessors. Was a too long of a word anyhow. Um, good? And it cannot be V1 or V2, because V1 and V2 are linearly independent. They come from B, which was a linearly independent set. It cannot be V1 or V2, since B was a linearly independent. Okay, so it's one of these remaining two W's and let's assume it's W1. Um, so assume it's W1. Okay, so here I have it's in the sense of uh, uh, ownership, and here I have it's in the sense of it is, and one of them has that uh, thingy, and I don't remember which was. It is. It is? This one? Yeah. Okay, I think I had it on the previous board as well. Okay, good. As long as we know the math. That's what's important, right? To know the math. Okay, it can be V1 or V2, since B was linearly independent, so it's one of the W's. Let's assume it's W1. Okay, so what am I going to do now? Help me out here. Help Steinitz out here. Same thing. Right, same thing. Let's throw W1 away. It's a linear combination of the others, of its predecessors. We don't need it for spanning. And we're almost done. So define... Where are we? It's going to be A4. A4 is going to be the set V1, V2, and W3. Right? A4 is again a spanning set because A3 was a spanning set 
right? And we threw away W1, which was a linear combination of the other, of the others. So A4 spans V. And now let's add V3. Okay. And A5 is going to be V1, V2, throw in V3, and W3 is still there. And A5 spans V and is linearly independent. Right? Sorry, linearly dependent. Okay? Because this was a spanning th set and we added another element, so it's a linear combination of the others. Okay? Spans V plus linearly dependent. Good? So there's an element here that's a linear combination of its predecessors and it cannot be these V's because they come from B and B was linearly independent. So it's W3. W3 is a linear combination of its predecessors, right? We can throw it out. So let's write that. Almost done. I'm not going to write again by the aforementioned theorem since uh, V1 is non-zero. There exists an element which is a linear combination of its predecessors. It cannot be V1, V2, and V3 since they came from B and B was a linearly independent set. So it has to be W3. Okay, I'm not going to write all that, but that's the idea. It's, we're just repeating it again and again. So um, therefore, W3 is a linear combination of V1, V2, and V3. Good? So let's throw it out, and we have A6, which is just V1, V2, and V3. And it spans V, right? Because A5 spanned V, and W3 was actually extra there because it was a linear combination of the others, so if we throw it out, it's still a spanning set. Do you agree? Okay. But what does it mean that it spans V? It means that any vector in V is a linear combination of these guys, in particular, V4. V4, v4 is a linear combination of V1, V2, and V3. And that's a contradiction because we started out with assuming that B is linearly independent. Right? This is a contradiction. To our um, original original uh, assumption that B is linearly independent. Okay? So by starting out with two disjoint even sets one spanning and one linearly independent, where the linearly independent one has more elements than the uh, spanning set, we manage to force a contradiction here. Manage to force linear dependence on the elements of the uh, uh, presumably linearly independent set. And that's a contradiction. Okay? I think this is a very... Personally, I think that this is a beautiful lemma. It's a beautiful idea. Uh, Non-trivial. Non it's not just, you know, manipulating the, the definition. It's really, there's, there's somebody, well, we know who that somebody is. Steinitz woke up one morning and had a bright idea. Okay? And, and it works. Okay? And this is precisely what's needed to show that any two bases in a uh, finite dimensional vector space have precisely the same number of elements. Okay, good? Clear? Okay. Are we to prove it for a um, general size, the span and linear independent set? Not one, two, three, four, one, two, three. 
It would be the same idea, you just have to be careful with indices. So you would take A to be W1 to WK, and B to be V1 to VM, and assume that M is greater than K, and write the same thing. I would have to do these stages and then assume it continues all through K, or? Yeah, you would have to, you would have to trace the exact same idea. I don't, I, I don't understand what you mean you can assume. You would have to do the exact same steps, exactly the same steps, but not, uh, what did we do, reach A6, but you're going to reach AM. Okay? But you'd have to do it enough times. Okay? And of course, somewhere in the middle, you're, you're, you're not going to do it again and again. You're going to say, uh, uh, etc. And the formal way of saying etc. in math is induction. Right? But that, that, that's, that's basically the idea. It's the exact same idea. Exactly the same idea. Clear? Do you see that, the, 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 that there's nothing special about 3 or 4? Okay, if I, if I were to do it with 7 and 8, it would be the same thing. It would just be longer. Okay, so the idea is really here. Really, really. Good? Okay. So, now that we have this very useful tool, I want to actually... Uh, list some more uh, properties of bases in a, in, a, in a finite dimensional vector space, which are, again, very basic, very useful, but they're already going to be based on this exchange lemma. Okay, so they're going to they're gonna rely on the fact that we already know that any two bases have the same number of elements and that any spanning, any spanning set necessarily has uh, um, at least as many elements as uh, uh, a linearly independent set. Okay, so let's list a few more theorems. And once we have this tool, the proofs are going to be very, very short. So the really the this lemma is the key ingredient in 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 a whole line of of statements about properties of bases. Okay, so here's the theorem. It has, uh, it's actually five theorems. I'm just going to list them as five parts of the, th the same theorem because they're really closely related. So let V be a vector space, a vector space with the dimension of V equals N. So I'm assuming it's a finite dimensional vector space with N vectors in any given basis. Okay? Then, one, um, any spanning set with N element is a basis. You can see that this is a useful fact. So usually when we want to take a set and determine if it's a basis, we need to check two things. We need to check that it spans the entire space, and we need to check that it's linearly independent. Okay? What this tells you is, if you take a set with n elements, where n is the dimension, it suffices to check that it's a spanning set. If it's a spanning set, it's automatically going to be a basis. You don't need to check linearly independent. Okay? So it's a useful tool. Here's another one. Any linearly, oops, any linearly independent set with n elements is a basis. So if you took a set that has n elements, the dimension uh, of v elements, and it's linearly independent, that's it. It's a basis. You don't need to check that it spans. Okay? Three, any uh, spanning set has at least n elements 
meaning you can't spend V with less than its dimension number of elements. Okay, if V is of dimension 6, there's no way you can find uh, a spanning set that has 5 elements. Okay, and again, the, the complementary statement to, to, to 3 is any linearly independent set has at most n elements. So if V is seven dimensional, there's no way you can find eight elements, eight vectors which are linearly independent. And finally, five, any uh, linearly independent set can be completed to form a basis. So if you want to somehow uh, find the basis for V that includes specific vectors that, that you have as a start, and we'll see where these ideas become useful uh, a bit later when we start talking about subspaces. So suppose you have, for example, a subspace, and you have a basis for that subspace, and you want to form a basis for the entire space, which includes the basis for that subspace, okay? Then you can do it. You can complete the set to a basis of the entire space, okay? So before, before I prove these five statements, and, and the proofs are going to be very, very simple based on the exchange lemma, I want to give you an example of five. Okay, just so we get the idea here. So here's an example of five. Um, here it is. So let's erase this. So example. So let's take uh, four two by two matrices, one, two, three, four, one, zero, zero, six. Well, let's start with two matrices. So these matrices belong to M to R, right? Two by two matrices over R, okay? What's the dimension of M to R? Four, right? It's a four-dimensional vector space, and we know that because we know the, the, what we call the standard bases. Remember those EIs, EIIs, EIJs, right? One, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, etc. Okay? So this is a four-dimensional vector space. So obviously, by the theorem with the five parts that we just wrote, this is not going to be a basis, because any basis is going to have four elements. Okay? But we can take these two and do you agree that they're linearly independent? Why? Tell me the precise answer, why you can see that they're linearly independent. Because neither is a linear combination of the other. Not a linear combination, a linear multiple, right? For two, for two guys to be linearly uh, dependent, one has to be a multiple of the other. We had that as a theorem as well, okay? So neither of these is a scalar multiple of the other, that's obvious, right? You can see that because both have one here, so the only scalar multiple it could be is one, and they're not equal. Okay, so therefore they're linearly independent. We can complete them, and completing them would be to take two more matrices somehow and get a linearly independent set of four guys that's already going to be a basis for the entire space. Okay, so how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, we straighten them out as rows in a bigger matrix. We've seen this idea. So here goes, one, two, three, four, and one, zero, zero, six. Okay, do you see that these are these two, these two guys, and I straighten them out, okay? And then I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add uh, two more guys and, and the re, okay, so, so I know that this one is not a multiple of this one, so I'm already guessing the next step, 
that I'm going to be able to write them as, as uh, uh, subtract this one from this one and get a leading coefficient here, which is non-zero. Right? I'm starting to do the row operations in my head before I'm even working on it, but I can see that I can force them to be of this form. Okay? So I'm guessing that, the, that if I throw in these two, okay, I'm, I'm making a wise guess at, at to what the echelon form is going to look like, this is going to be a basis. Okay? So I threw in these two which were needed kind of to complete it into a basis. Okay? So this is just an example. Okay? It's not a systematic way of doing it yet. It, it is the systematic way, but I'm not telling you all the details yet. There's, there's still a lot missing. Why did I straighten them out as rows? And there are some ingredients missing, but is the idea clear? Okay? And now I'm going to do these row operations. Okay? And the reason for doing the row operations are that if I reach the echelon form and there's no row of zeros, that means that they're linearly independent. Remember that theorem? If you take a matrix, okay, and you reach the echelon form, the rows were linearly independent if and only if there's a zero row in the echelon form. Okay? And here there is no zero row because all we need is one step, and the step would, would be subtract this row from this row, right? So we get uh, what? Uh, zero. Uh, minus 2, minus 3, and 2. And then 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1. And that's it. This is echelon form, right? No zero rows. So the rows here are linearly independent. And that's if and only if the rows here are linearly independent. Therefore, these are linearly independent. And therefore, therefore, these two matrices, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 0, 0, 6, together with these two matrices, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1, this set of four elements is a basis for M2R. That includes the two that we started out with, which were linearly independent. Okay, good. Is the idea clear? Okay, so we can always take a, a, a linearly independent set, and if there are not sufficiently many elements, we can complete it and make it into a basis. Good? Okay, so what I want to do now is return to our theorem with, uh, let's look back at this board to the theorem with the five parts and, and prove it. And I'm not going to prove them in the order that they're written, okay? But it doesn't matter as long as I'm not doing anything cyclic, okay? So I'm going to prove, uh, first prove four, then prove three, then prove two, then prove one, and then prove five, okay? So let's do that. So are there any, any questions, or is everything uh, clear? Everybody good? It's clear. Clear, good. Okay. Um, so proof, proof of the theorem. Proof. So first I want to prove four. So four said that any linearly independent set has at most n elements. Okay, so the dimension of V equals N. That's the, the data of the theorem. Therefore, any basis has N elements. Thus, any basis of V has exactly N elements. Elements. Right? Now, any basis is a spanning set, which is also linearly independent, okay? So you took a basis, any basis, it has n elements, and it's a spanning set. 
By the exchange lemma, any linearly independent set has less than or equal to n elements. Good? So it has n elements, any basis of E has n elements, and is a spanning set. Because it's a basis. Therefore, by the exchange lemma, by the exchange lemma, uh, any linearly independent set has less than or equal to n elements. And that's it. That's what we claimed in part four. Good? Okay, part three, precisely the same idea. Any basis of V has n elements. Okay, so part three said that any uh, spanning set has at most n elements. Okay, so the dimension of V is n, therefore any basis has n elements and is a linearly independent set. Okay, so any basis of V has n elements and is linearly independent. Good. By the exchange lemma, any spanning set has greater than or equal to n elements. Right? So by the exchange lemma, any spanning set has any spanning set has greater than or equal number of elements of the basis of, of, of a linearly independent set. So it has greater than or equal to n elements. Good? It could have much more than n elements, but then, of course, they, some of them would be extra, right? But just as a spanning set, there's no statement of optimality in terms of having extra guys. It has at least n elements by the exchange limit. Good? Okay, part two. Part two said, take any linearly independent set with n elements, it's a basis. Okay, so take a linearly independent set, so let B be a linearly independent set with n elements. Okay? So the, the, the claim of part two of the theorem is that B is a basis. What do I need to show in order for B to be a basis? I need to show that it's spanning, right? I already know that it's linearly independent. I need to show that it's spanning. But by part uh, four, by part four, B has n elements, okay? And part four, let, let's look at the theorem again. Part four said that any linearly independent set has at most n elements, right? Now we're taking a linearly independent set with n elements. That's the at most, okay? We're taking a linearly independent set that has the maximal number of elements it could have and still be linearly independent, right? So it's what we called a maximal linearly independent set. And now I'm, I'm going to refer to a previous theorem again. A maximal linearly independent set is a basis. Remember that theorem? Okay, so let's write that. So let B be a linearly independent set with n elements by uh, part 4, it is maximal linear independent, linearly independent, and therefore, and thus, a basis by a previous theorem.
Good? The previous theorem I'm referring to is the one that had three parts and we wrote TFAE, the following are equivalent. Being a basis, being maximal linearly independent, or being minimal spanning. Remember that theorem? Okay. And the proof of part one is going to be precisely based on the same theorem. So let's look at the theorem and then write. So part one claims that any spanning set with n elements is a basis. Okay. Part three says, which we already proved, that any spanning set has at least n elements. So if we take a spanning set with n elements, okay, it's a minimal spanning set, right? And a minimal spanning set is a basis by that theorem. Okay, so let's write that. So, one by, what was it, by part um, uh, three, uh, what wait, we have to write, okay, let B, let B be a uh, spanning set, Spa spanning, oh, not nice, spanning set, with n elements by part 3 it is minimal a minimal spanning set and therefore and therefore a basis by the previous theorem Good? Everybody? Okay. And finally, we want to prove part 5. So part 5 is what we, what we did in the example. Any linearly independent set can be completed into a basis for the entire space. Okay. So let V1, V2, all the way up to Vk be linearly independent. So this is a linearly independent set of vectors in V. Okay. If k equals n, then we're done. It's a basis, right? By part, uh, I don't even remember, uh, by part 2, right? Any linearly independent set with n vectors is a basis, right? So if k equals n, we're done. Do you agree? Okay. If k is less than n, so it's a linearly independent, k, k cannot be greater than n by part, uh, by part 4. Any linearly independent set has at least at most, n elements, right? So we, we cannot have more than n uh, elements in a linearly independent set, okay, by part 4. So, uh, so if k is not n, then it has to be less than n. Do you agree? Okay, so if k is less than n, then let's call this set b. Let b equal this set. Okay, if k is less than n, then b is not a basis. How do I know that? Right, you're looking at the right place. You have to look at the theorem. If I take a set with less than n elements, it can't be a basis because by part... Um, Three, it can't be a spanning set. A spanning set has to have at least n elements. Okay, so I already used, let, let's write what we used, because we're really using the previous four parts. If k equals n, we're done by, by 
what did we say by uh, two? Do you agree? And then here we're missing K can't be greater than N by four. Right? Because four says that any any linearly independent set has at most n elements, right? And now if k is less than n, that b is not a basis by, not a basis because it's not a spanning set by three. three. Do you agree? Three said that a spanning set has to have at least n elements, but this one doesn't, okay? So it's not a basis, so it's not a maximal linearly independent set. Because any basis is a maximal linearly independent set. So if k is less than n, then b is not a basis, and, and therefore, and so, b is not maximal linearly independent. Do you agree? Okay, again by the theorem of the, the following are equivalent. A basis, if and only if, it's maximal linearly independent. Meaning that we can throw in another guy. Okay, throw in another guy and still maintain linear independence. Okay, so there is some guy. Okay, I'm not telling you who it is, but there is. There exists somebody that we can throw in and still maintain the property of being linearly independent. Do you agree? Therefore... We can add some vector let's call it V K plus one to B and preserve the property of being linearly independent maintaining the property of linear independence. So B together with this guy is still linearly independent. And then we run the same argument again. If that's it, if, we're, if, if with this element we have n elements, we're done. If we still don't have n elements, then it's not a basis, therefore it's not maximal, Therefore, we can throw in one more guy and still have a linearly independent set. Okay? If now we're at n, we're done. If not, then we're still not at n, then it's not a basis, then it's not maximal, then there's still one more guy we can throw in, and eventually we're going to reach n. Okay? So is the idea clear? Okay? So I can either erase another board, write all that, and, or I can add here, etc. Can you see this? Etc. And then put the little Talmush here. Is the idea clear? Let me say it again, okay? If B, this set, together with one more guy, is now a basis, we're done. In, in other words, if K, if, if K plus one equals N, now we have k plus one element, because we added one. If that equals n, we're done by two, right? We have n elements in a, in a linearly independent set, that's a basis. If not, if k plus one is still less than n, then it's not a basis, because it's not a spanning set, because a spanning set has to have at least n elements. If it's not a basis, it's still not maximal linearly independent. We can throw one more guy. So do you see that this is an algorithm that tells you, that, so this is a, really an algorithm that tells you you can complete it into a basis, but it's not constructive. You don't know who that VK plus one is, okay? It doesn't tell you where in the example, let's look back at this example, which is still on the board. It doesn't tell you in a constructive manner why this was VK plus one and why this was VK plus two. Okay, so the way to see that is what I actually did in, in the idea, well, at least in this example, 
And this is general, but that's not part of the proof of that theorem. Clear? Okay. Um, okay, so this was pretty long. This was a rather long lesson, and it had a lot of details. But what you should pick up, for, up from it is, is, is the basic facts, okay? The proofs are important as well, and the ideas show up again and again, but the facts are what's important, okay? So there's this exchange lemma that a, a spanning set always has uh, greater than or equal to number of elements as a linearly independent set, and then there are all the corollaries of the lemma. The theorem that any two bases have the same number of elements, and then this theorem with with the five, the five phrases here that is very useful, okay? Useful, practically useful, okay? Very practical. You wanna check that a set with n elements is a basis, it suffices to check one of the properties, the other one comes for free, okay? Very useful when you're working on concrete examples, okay, good? Okay, so what I wanna do uh, next is to discuss this idea of bases for subspaces, okay? What can we say about bases and dimensions of subspaces of a vector space? And that's what we're gonna do next.